everyone, it's Jennifer, and I have for you this day in history, February the 22nd. In 1980, U.S. hockey team beats the Soviets in the Miracle on Ice. In 1967, Sun Huarto uh, takes full power in Indonesia. In 1819, the U.S. acquires Spanish Florida. In 1847, the Battle of Buena Vista begins. In 1777, Archibald Bullock dies under mysterious circumstances. In 1946, George Kennan sends a long telegram to State Department. In 2006, Gang commits largest robbery in British history. In 2014, El Chapo, the world's most wanted drug kingpin, is captured in Mexico. In 1959, Lee Petty wins the first Daytona 500. In 1969, Barbara Jo Rubin becomes the first female jockey to win a race at the U.S. A thoroughbred track. In 1732, George Washington is born. In 1968, the Tet Offensive ends. In 1917, Mussolini wounded by a mortar bomb. And in 1942, President Roosevelt to MacArthur get out of the Philippines. And let's go for some words of the day. Our first word of the day is, I think it's Dematis. I could be wrong. Demitas. Oh, Demitas. It is a noun. It is French, mid-19th century. It is a small coffee cup. Examples in a sentence. My aunt is particular about her beverages, and she will only drink after her dinner. Coffee is out of a Demitas cup and saucer. The second, my spare change in an it my spare change in an adorable pattern demitas. Interesting. Our next word of the day is zydeco. Z y d e c o noun, and it is uh, Louisiana Creole, 1960s. It means a kind of Black American dance music, originally from Southern Louisiana, typically featuring an accordion and a guitar. Examples in a sentence. The Zydeco poured out of the concert hall and into the street. The second, no Mardi Gras party is complete without a Zydeco soundtrack. And our last word of the day is prepense. P-R-E-P-E-N-S-E. It is an adjective. It is Anglo-Norman French, 17th century. It means deliberate or intentional. Examples in a sentence, the bird seemed to swoop down at my cat with a prepense hostility. The second, the prosecution sought to show that the defendant committed the crime with malice prepense. Interesting. And let's go on to some interesting facts. So the first interesting fact that we have is Picasso was once suspected of stealing the Mona Lisa. When the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre on August 21st, 1911, the art world immediately went into mourning and began wondering who was behind the dastardly deed. One man soon under suspicion was none other, th none other than Pablo Picasso whose name was given to the authorities by Henri, Henri Joseph Jerry uh, Pierre, the former secretary of Picasso's friend and famed poet, uh, Guillaume Apollonier. Pierre had previously stolen it at least two Bronze Age Iberian sculptures from the Louvre and sold them to the then up and coming Cubist artist who used them as inspiration for his painting Les Demesuales et d'Avignon. At the time, the Louvre's security was rather lacking. The paintings weren't even bolted to the walls. A terrified Picasso and Apon Apollonier were eventually brought to court where it was determined that Picasso was indeed in possession of stolen art, just not the Mona Lisa. The Iberian statues were quickly returned, and the judge let both Picasso and Apollonian air off with a warning. The search for the mysterious Mona Lisa took two years, during which time its popularity grew exponentially. Its reprodu as reproductions were splashed across newspapers worldwide, um, in December 1913, uh, Venencio Perugia, 
an Italian employee of a firm that cut glass for the Louvre, emerged as a real thief after he tried to sell the painting <clears throat> to an antique dealer in Florence. Perugia is said to have believed that the Mona Lisa rightfully belonged to Italy and expected a reward for returning it. Fortunately, the antique dealer called the police. Perugia later served eight months in prison for his crime. Suffice it to say that the Louvre's security has vastly improved in the century since, and the painting isn't leaving its exhibit anytime soon. Those are some tough words to say. Um, another interesting fact. The world's most massive plant is a stand of 47,000 genetically identical aspen trees. In central Utah, State Highway UT-25 cuts through a strand of quaking aspens near the Alpine Fish Lake. Many travelers driving south from Salt Lake City looking for a relaxing weekend getaway likely drive by this stretch of forest unaware that they've just seen one of the greatest and strangest natural wonders in the world. That's because this particular strand of quaking aspens, known as Pando, is the world's largest plant, containing some 47,000 trees spread across 107 acres. At first glance, the aspens look like any other forest, but hidden wonders are locked inside their DNA. Although scientists first recognized Pando's extraordinary qualities in the 1970s, only in 2008 did they confirm that the aspens are all genetically identical. Unlike many other trees that reproduce sexually using seeds and pollen, these aspens produce asexually by sprouting from Pando's underground root system. That means they're genetic clones of the same original aspen, now long dead. While asexual reproduction is far from rare for aspens, a clone of this size is. Because the trees are genetically identical, and because they all share a root system, they're considered one plant, no matter how separate they may appear above ground. Pando has been growing for tens of thousands of years to create the trembling giant that now awes both tourists and scientists today. I find that rather interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Let's get an inspiring quote. Today's quote comes from Stephen Covey. Change, real change, comes from the inside out. Change, real change, comes from the inside out. And let us go on to our daily devotional. Okay. Today's daily devotional, The Heart of the Giver. That sounds good, actually. All right, the heart of the giver. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. Mark chapter 12, verse 44. You may know the story of the widow who gave two small coins in the temple, two coins that were barely worth a penny. Doesn't seem like much, does it? Especially when you consider that wealthier people in the temple were giving much larger offerings. Jesus, Jesus honored this woman's gift because she gave all she had. She held nothing back from God. The rich man's gift was larger, but it didn't really cost him much. He had so much money that the gift was extra money to him. Jesus looks at the heart of the giver and how much she holds back for herself compared to how much she is willing to give others. Will you give Jesus everything? There are three kinds of givers the flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. To get anything out of a flint, you must hammer it, when you get only chips and sparks. To get water out of a sponge, you must squeeze it, and the more you use pressure, the more you will get. But the honeycomb just overflows with its own sweetness. Which kind of a giver are you? Anonymous. That's really good. All right, and our holidays for today, it is Ash Wednesday. National Margarita Day, National Walking the Dog Day, 222 Day, Be Humble Day, Cook a Sweet Potato Day, Day of Fraternity and Cohesion, European Day for Victims of Crime, Inconvenience Yourself Day, so you get ready to make it life a little easier for other people, that's awesome, uh, Independence Day, St. Lucia, 
National California Day, National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day, Pink Shirt Day in Canada, Play More Cards Day, Recreational Sports and Fitness Day, Scouts Founders Day, Single Tasking Day, St. Lucia's Independence Day, Supermarket Employee Day, Tex Avery Day, It's Woolworths Day. That's pretty cool. I remember Woolworths. Uh, World Thinking Day. And for the birthdays, it is Drew Barrymore's, James Blunt's, uh, Robert Kardashian's. So, I hope you guys have a great day today. Maybe have some sweet potatoes. In the meantime, please stay safe, be kind to one another, and as always, happy yarning. Bye now.